Deuteronomy 7. The Bible says, preach the word and a lot of times I'll get a word. A word or a phrase and I'll just study it, I'll just chase it, I'll go through all the Bible. And yesterday I spent quite a few hours studying unclean and what that means. In the New Testament, it's the first place you find the, the phrase unclean spirits. And Jesus drove out and cast out unclean spirits. Um, from what I could count yesterday, the phrase unclean spirit, unclean devils, <clears throat> in the four gospels 18 times 18 is 6 plus 6 plus 6 I don't think that's an accident and um, but the different infirmities that people had the different uh, ways that Mary Magdalene herself Jesus expelled seven devils out of her from my study into different branches of witchcraft occult practices mysticism I believe that she got those seven devils from certain religious practices that she was doing she there was there was certain occult things that she was involved in she was playing with devils that she had no idea how dangerous they were and they ended up taking over her. And Jesus had compassion on her and removed those seven devils. You know how he did it? He didn't wiggle his nose. He didn't cast a magic spell. He didn't hold a crucifix in front of her. The Bible said they marveled because with his word he was able to drive out unclean spirits. That's one of the things that you kind of ponder, you think about. That it's the word of God that unclean spirits, they can't handle the presence of the word of God. When you find yourself being bothered, oppressed, tempted, tortured by spirits, the remedy that you have is the Word of God and maybe even prayer and fasting. Now that would be another message or a lesson to teach is to teach on prayer and fasting and it's a absolute no marvel to me whatsoever. In fact, I got into an argument with a man over this because there are two places in your Bible, in your King James Bible, where Jesus said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Two places where he said that, and you look in an NIV or a New American Standard or a Christian Standard or any of the modern Bibles, and both of those have been deleted out of those Bibles. What does that tell you? That when you put your confidence in these new Bibles, you are leaving out something that Jesus said is the way to get rid of devils that just won't leave. But they'll leave with prayer and fasting. And I believe that. I've seen it happen. And boy, I ought, to, I ought to teach on prayer and fasting this morning, but I don't have it prepared. 
I'm just going to ask you this morning without, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'll ask you this morning, when's the last time you prayed and fasted for a day? When is the last time? What is it that's been important enough to you for you to want to pray so that God will hear you, God will bless you? And it's not, you know, I've, I've said before, I believe God will hear you one time when you pray. But I also believe that some things are worth wrestling over. If you remember, Jesus taught us a story about an unjust judge. Who when an older woman went to him and asked this judge, he was a wicked, bribed judge. Probably a drunkard, womanizer. He was an unjust judge. And when the woman went to him and said, avenge me of my adversaries, he wouldn't do it. Probably because he favored her adversaries. But the woman persisted. It was important to her that she be avenged of her adversary. You know who our adversary is, don't you? It's the devil. And it was important enough to her to where she kept going back to the judge, kept going back to the judge and wouldn't shut up. And finally, the unjust judge said, I, I'm, I'm sick of this woman. I've had it. I can't take no more of it. And he did what she asked him to do simply to get her off of his back. Now, the lesson took me a long time for me to understand that lesson. I'm going, God, you're not. Are you an unjust judge? What God? The meaning of that was. If even a wicked, bribed, drunkard, womanizer, unjust judge would do what someone pleaded with him to do, how much more a God who loves you and is not unjust would he not do what you asked him to do or better than what you asked him to do? Boy, that's a, that's a good message. I'm going to let's stand and be dismissed. If Jimmy Carmichael was still here, he would have stood and said, I'm okay. Job 14, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. If you've got dirty dishes... Or if you've got clean dishes in your dishwasher that you haven't taken out. And then somebody comes along behind you and puts in dirty dishes in the dishwasher. You now have a dishwasher full of dirty dishes. You can't bring a clean thing out of something that's unclean. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Look at what God said. Now remember, I spent, I did, I spent probably most of my day yesterday looking at this one passage and this one phrase in the Bible, unclean. 200 some odd occurrences. It wasn't time wasted, I guarantee you. It was good for me to go and look at what I found things I never knew were there. So you understand that I probably have a lot more verses in my notes than what I have time for today. Unless you just want to stay. I didn't get an amen, so I'll. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. God said, thou art what kind of people? What does that word mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to help me preach this message today. So I want you to put your thinking caps on. And, and I want you to think. What does that word mean? Holy people. Pure. What you Set apart. Sanctified. Clean. You're all, you're all right. Set apart, sanctified, clean, pure. God said you're a holy people. Unto the Lord thy God. 
The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Do you not understand? This is how God sees you. When God is ready to pour out his vials of wrath, he has reserved a place for his elect to not be part of those vials of wrath. I pondered something the other day, since I'm just thinking out loud and chasing rabbits anyway. God said that he would hide them in his pavilion. And if you look up that word in your King James Bible, you'll find out where that pavilion is. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to make you look it up. Write it down. Go home. Get a strong concordance. Look up the word pavilion or pavilions or use the King James Fear Bible search software on your computer and look that up. God said he would hide us there in the day of trouble. It's neat. But anyway, the Lord, verse 7, did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. And isn't that true? Joel Osteen had to buy a basketball stadium to put all of the people in there. And it's a show, is what he's, he's a showman that puts on a show. And I was listening to some guys talk about him yesterday. When he goes out to different places in the country and speaks, to be able to sit in row D, down on the floor, close to the stage where he is, for two people, it's $4,500 to be able to sit in row D to listen to that man lie to you. And he fills the house wherever he goes. So those people are not the ones that God's talking about here. He said, you're fewer in number than anybody else. So that's not why he, that's not why he picked you. He didn't pick you because there was as many of us. He picked us. Because he loved us. But because the Lord loved you, verse 8, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out. That's exactly what Brother George said. Separated. He brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house, out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. But God said, you're a holy people. And who can bring a clean thing out of and unclean. Not one. But you think about what that means pertaining to you. And then apply it to your family. Your household. Apply it then to this church. Apply it to a nation, this nation. We live in an unclean nation. I don't look for this country to last. I'm not a doomsayer, but I this, there's no way with the amount of wickedness and civil division in this country that we will last. It never happened. And it won't. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I have nothing to give these people. Nothing. So we're knocking on your door as our neighbor this morning. These people are on a long journey through life. And they're tired, they're weary, and they're hungry. And I have no bread. They've come to me, Father, and I have no bread to give them. Nothing. So, Lord Jesus, would you rise and give us bread? 
that we may be satisfied and be rested and built up again, Father, for another week. Father, between last Sunday and today, three people left this earth that we know of, that we are familiar with, that we have been told about. Three people have left this world and have stood before you. And Father, it is appointed to each one of us to be taken out of this world and stand in front of you to be judged. And God, that is part of me, Lord, that's, that worries me. Because I know some of the things that have been written down in that book that I've done and my hope is that those things have been blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ that is where my faith is nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd help me to preach. Give me the words. Let it be a blessing to someone, an encouragement to someone, a warning to someone, a chastisement to someone, a correction to someone. Father, I want my life clean. I don't, I don't, I don't want anything else. And I only know how to cling to the righteousness of the cross. It's all I know to how to do. So Father, help us, each one of us, as we measure ourselves and judge ourselves this morning. Help us, Father, to do that, to cling to the cross, to be holy people. Father, just give us the message. Teach it to us. Let us take it home in our minds, in our hearts. Ponder it as we go before you today. We ask your blessings now in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Turn to Leviticus chapter 5. Just follow with me. I'm just going to go kind of easy. Take you from scripture to scripture. This is, this is pretty much in the order. You know, when I study something, I... Type it in. I got that software that Donna made for us. And what a blessing that is. And I just type that phrase, unclean, put a little asterisk next to it. And that gives me unclean, uncleanness, uncleaningly. I don't think that's a word, but it covers it. It'll find everything in the Bible that mentions something being unclean. And I read it, read the Go walk circumspect around it. I'll look at the verse and I'll open up that chapter and read that chapter. Look what's before and after. Look at what God's saying. And some things then I put into my notes. Leviticus 5 verse 1. And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness whether he has seen or known of it. If he do not utter it then he shall bear his iniquity. So... The first thing that we draw our attention to as we look in our Bible at unclean is an unclean mouth. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this morning to give me examples. Not Don't cuss. But give me examples of what an unclean mouth is and does. Like, I mean, uh, the obvious one is someone who curses. Gossiping is an unclean mouth. Didn't your mama tell you, if you ain't got nothing nice to say about somebody, don't say nothing about somebody. Didn't your mom, did your mom tell you that? He's got his hand raised back there. He's saying, my mama, God bless you, Jennifer. Your mama must have taught you that. Am I right? If you ain't got nothing nice to say about somebody, don't say it. A gossiping mouth is an unclean mouth. Sandy. 
lying mouth, Courtney, tearing others down, yes, talking behind people's back, that's an unclean mouth, isn't it? So, can, a clean, can, a, can something clean come out of a dirty mouth? Somebody will say to you, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Right? You've heard that one, right? You talk that way, do you kiss your mama with that mouth? That's a nasty mouth you got. John? A prideful mouth is an unclean mouth. Bragging about, look, look at what I've done. I did that. Well, it's good stuff. Sounds like we know then what it is. Now, can God still use you? Now, and, and I want you to, uh, here, I want you to get this now. The things that you've said are things you've done. Was I right in saying that? You know, I worked in construction. I know how they talk. Yeah. She said I should work at Walmart. I've, I've, I've been out there. I know how people talk. And... You know, here I am coming fresh out of Bible college into a construction area, listening to these guys talk. And I wasn't ready for that. And after a while, I got used to it. And then after a while, it, I had an impulse to join in. That ain't right. So then... God says, Mike, I want you to preach. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah stood and he saw the Lord lifted a high and lifted up. And he saw the seraphim there surrounding him. And Isaiah immediately fell. And he said, Whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. And an angel from the Lord took a coal off the altar of God and put it on Isaiah's lips and purged his lips. And he said, Now you can speak. But don't you listen to this now. What's unclean must be purged and washed. Washed. You know what that means? The water of the Word cleaning your mouth. Stop cussing. Stop lying. Stop gossiping. Stop tearing people down, talking behind their back. Cut it out. Ask God to purge your mouth and to wash it clean. Amen. Verse 2, or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of unclean cattle or the carcass of an unclean creeping things and if it be hidden from him he also shall be unclean and guilty I wonder if I could ask you examples of touching an unclean thing what we would come up with who's got an idea John an idol. Books. Keep your hands off dirty books. John? Listen to me. Keep your hand off some other woman. We are a nation of gropers. We're a nation of gropers. Men who can't keep their hands. You know, they nailed Matt Lauer. 
all that time he was being showing himself being Mr. Nice Guy on the Today Show, you find out he is the nastiest, filthiest, adulterous. They got him for rape now. They got him for rape. Couldn't keep his hands off women. I've known people like that. Men going after teenage girls, keep putting their hands on them. Church people doing it. That hand, that man's guilty. That woman's guilty. Women do it too. Put their hands on men knowing what that does to them. Or if we touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that a man should be defiled withal, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth it, he, then he shall be guilty. I want you to keep that in your mind now, what God said about touching unclean things. If you touch something unclean, you're unclean. Your whole body's unclean. It defiles all of you. Turn to Leviticus 15. I've made that small so you can't see it. Unless you squint really hard. Uh, Leviticus 15. Look at this. This is going now, this is where it's going to affect all of us. It's going to reach in and get us. Okay? Leviticus 15. Verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, like he's got a sword that won't heal, there's also laws, and I didn't really get into this, but there's laws for women too, who have a running issue for, their, for a time, they are unclean. And if you remember, there was a woman who had that issue going on for 12 years in her life. 12 years. And she spent all on doctors and they could not fix her. And then she went to Jesus. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. And she was made whole. So keep that in mind while we read this. When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, I'm in verse 2, because of his issue, he is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in his issue. Whether his flesh run with his issue or his flesh be stopped from his issue, it is his uncleanness. Even if the scab has scabbed it over, as long as that's there, that man's unclean. You understand what God's doing. God is keeping that these people don't know about bacteria and germs and God is teaching his people that... To keep down the spread of infection, if you've got something on you, stay away from everybody and don't let anybody touch you. There were, we have stories of doctors in the 1800s who, when they read the Bible, they started washing their hands after examining patients and all of a sudden their patients stopped dying. And they said, there must be something that's carried from one person to another by me, the physician. I'll start what one guy, he was a, a female doctor. And he had all these women in the hospital dying. He was examining them and he was touching them. And when he started washing his hands, when he went from one to the other, they stopped dying. And he went, there must be something on my hands that we can't see. And you go to the doctor, go to the hospital. Every time they come in your room, squirt, squirt. And they touch you and then they walk out, squirt, squirt, wash again, go out in the hall and do the next one in the next room. It's standard practice now because we know. But God was trying, watch this. God was trying to stop the spread of the uncleanness. You listen to your Bible now. So verse 4, look at verse 4. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean. You've made your whole bed unclean. And every thing whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. 
And whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. And he that sitteth on anything wherein he that sat hath the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be unclean until the even. Now, are you seeing a pattern here? Wash. Wash. Verse 7, And he that toucheth the flesh of him that hath the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be clean until the even. And if he that hath the issue spit upon him that is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. This is why preachers preach way up here, because we spit on people. <laughs> Amen, Brother Sterling? He's had to dodge a few. Verse 8, or verse 9. What saddle whatsoever he rideth upon he that hath the issue shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth anything that was under him shall be unclean until the even. And he that beareth any of those things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. And be unclean until the even. You know, I think, you know what I think else is in this? I think God might be talking about diarrhea too. That's why the chair and the saddle. God said, if the man's got diarrhea, don't sit, don't sit on his saddle. It's a, and we know then that a virus causes a stomach issue and that we have an issue. We've got stuff coming out of here, coming out of here, and nobody else wants that. So God said, wherever that man was, whatever he sat on, whatever he touched, whatever, and if it spit on you, that virus came out of him, it's on you now, now you're going to get it. He touched the doorknob, you touched the doorknob, now you're going to get it. And God said, whatever it is, it's got, you've got to wash. Now watch this. Wash his clothes and bathe himself in the water, being clean until the even. Verse 11. And whomsoever he toucheth that hath the issue, hath not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and being unclean until the even. Now here's what this is saying. You listen. We think that our own private, secret sins don't affect anybody but us. And we're wrong. So, you got it. Let's say you got an unclean mouth. Your kids hear that. So what are your kids going to do? They're going to repeat it. I did. I heard my mama when I was little say something when we was living up here say something to the, one of the neighbors dirty and I repeated it and my mama turned around boy don't you say that cause I was laughing <laughs> boy don't you say that and I'm going but you didn't I wouldn't have said it if she hadn't I remember what it was, but I'm not going to tell you what it was. But we think that our own personal uncleanness won't affect anybody else, but it will. If you had a stomach virus, everybody in your house is in danger of getting that virus. Are they not? So, you're cursing or you're lying is going to affect your house or you're gossiping or you're tearing down people. It's going to affect your house. Or your liquor, your alcohol, 
that you've got hid, your kids are going to find it. Your kids are going to find it. Or your magazines. Or your computer porn. Your kids are going to find it. And now you've made them unclean with your uncleanness. Just like if you had a virus. And then you come into the house of God. Did not God judge the whole nation of Israel when one man sinned? Achan. When Achan took what he wasn't supposed to, he touched the unclean thing, did not God slaughter thousands out of the army of Israel? Did not the whole nation have to suffer because of one man sin? You know, here's what God's doing. God had to make Achan an example in front of everybody on how he treats uncleanness. And the bottom line is, if you hang around unclean people, are you clean or unclean? You unclean? If you come into God's house unclean and leave that same way, whose fault is that? That's yours. That's not mine. And it's not everybody else's. But you've just defiled the house of God. That's how God sees it. Deuteronomy 23. Turn there. And there's, here's your proof of what I just said. Now, and I, and I recognize I'm not just preaching to the people here. There's, there's a lot of people on the other side of that camera. And I had a guy call me this. I'm not kidding you. I had a guy call this week, bawling his eyes out. Because I, I said, I don't remember which one it was, but whatever it was that I preached or taught in whatever format, he called and bawling his eyes out. And he said, Mike, I'm so filthy. And he said, I've got this thing and I'm not going to say what it was. But he's got an unclean thing in his life. And he doesn't want it there anymore. He doesn't know how to get rid of it. Only God can do that. And I've had, I get calls where people tell me their sins. I had a guy call. He admitted to a bunch of people online that he smokes marijuana. And he admitted to me on the phone. And I asked him, I said, does your wife know? No, she don't know. And he mentioned that he goes to church. I said, does your pastor know? He said, no, my pastor doesn't know. I said, why are you telling me? I can't help you. Somebody, somebody you know has to get involved in your life. Because you obviously cannot do this on your own. So I know there's somebody out there, something's going on in your life. And God is telling you, you're unclean. Deuteronomy 23, verse 10. If there be, if there be among you any man. You know what that means? Anybody. From here all the way down there. That is not clean by reason of uncleanness. That chanceth him by night. 
Then shall he go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp, but it shall be when evening cometh on, he shall wash himself with water. When the sun is down, he shall come into the camp again. God is saying, don't bring your uncleanness into the camp. Don't bring it into your house. Don't bring it into your church. Don't bring it into your family. Don't bring it into your group of friends. Get it outside the camp. Get rid of it. Get washed. Then come back in. Because you're going to infect everybody. Do, and then verse 14. Now you look at this. Here's how God sees this. What I'm, here's what I want to do. I want to tell you to read Deuteronomy 23. Because it'll explain. And if you don't, I, I guess I'll go ahead and tell you. This is about bodily waste disposal. What caused the plague to run through Egypt? They went in chamber pots and then dumped them out in the street like stupid people. So the streets of Paris was just full of defecation and sewage. Raw sewage running everywhere. And they wonder why everybody was sick and dying. That sewage was full of disease. No wonder it, the, my, the rats were getting into it. And it was just spreading disease everywhere. It's filthy. God said, take it outside the camp and bury it. Is that, do you not have a septic tank? Or a city sewer? I used to work at the Festus Crystal City sewer plant. And I know it goes down into the ground. That's where it's supposed to go. And buried. So it's outside the city. City of Festus and Crystal City does not leave its sewage inside the city. They take it out like you're supposed to. Now Deuteronomy 23 uh, verse 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee. And to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore. Now look at the two things God said he was going to do. Number one, God said he's going to deliver you. Who wants deliverance? Raise your hand. Then he said, I'm going to give up your enemies before you. I'm going to destroy your enemies before you. Who wants your enemy destroyed? So you look at what God said the conditions are. Be holy. That he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. See, the devil's telling you the lie. That you can have unclean life and God will be okay with it. And God's not okay with it. You need it cleaned up, don't you? Um, turn to, uh, I'll put that up on the screen. See all my notes here? You all want me to stay and preach all that? Turn to 2 Corinthians 6. Verse, I have verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6. If you go to 14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. They're unclean, so when you're yoked to them, you're unclean. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? They, they're not, if, you're, if, if, if clean people get around dirty people, the clean people get dirty. What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Verse 16, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Did you know that we pay somebody every week to come in this church and clean up these nasty pews 
vacuum up this nasty floor, pick up all the trash that everybody's left, wipe everything down, clean the toilets, clean the urinals, clean the sink for you, so that when you come in here on Sunday, you got a clean church to come into. That's how I learned to play the piano. First thing my mom did when she got saved, she wanted to help out. So she used to come over here on Saturday or Friday or something like that and clean. I said, piano and teach myself how to play church songs. And my mom said, I think I'll give him piano lessons. So God said, what agreement at the temple of God with idols for you, the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. That's what Brother George said. Holiness was. Saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Keep your hands off of it. Keep yourself away from it. And God said, I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. If you do a search of the word touch, asterisk, and unclean asterisk, you'll find there in 33 verses of the King James Bible. 33, because Christ went to the cross and took that uncleanness of our life was laid upon his head. And he bore the sins of the entire world. That's what that crown of thorns was. He bore our sins and our transgressions and nailed them to his cross. And he gave us the water of the word of God to be clean therewith. So, I mean, think about your body. Who in here does go all week Adam that's not, not going to ask that because somebody might raise their hand I was going to ask you who goes all week without taking a shower somebody might raise their hand I don't want to embarrass you but if I go a day he he raised his up he's I'm proud of it I can go for weeks I love you my mom drew up a bath for me one night and said, now get in there and get your bath. So I went in there with my hand, splash the water around a little bit, come back out in my pajamas. And my mom said, I told you to take a bath. I did. She said, you're lying to me. No, you didn't. And I'm thinking to myself, how did she find out? Because I smelled like a dog. If I go more than a day without taking a shower, I just, I don't like myself. I need to get in and get cleaned up. I want to get cleaned up. That's in our nature. Is it not? It should be in your soul's nature to clean yourself with the water of the Word of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. Bow your head. And you folks online. I have I have asked God To help me live a clean life. I know how hard it is. But I want, I know I'm saved. I know, I'm, but I want to be clean. I want so that when I stand before God's people, cleanness comes forth from me instead of uncleanness. And whoever God's dealing with now, whether you're here or you're online, I want you to pray 
right where you are. You're going to, we're going to have an altar call, but it's going to be right in your pew if you want. Now, if you want to come down here, I'm not stopping you. But I'll let you just spend time with God right now. Asking God. God, clean me up. I don't want to live this dirty way anymore. God, please clean me up. Clean up my life. Clean up my mouth. Clean up my dirty mind. Wash my dirty eyes. Clean my dirty mouth. Clean my unclean hands. Father, I pray for these people as their pastor, as their friend, their brother, and their equal. God, I am not preaching down to anybody. And I'm not preaching or indicating in any way that I'm not speaking to myself. I'm preaching to me first. But Father, you know the heart, you know the life of everyone that's listening right now. And I know your Holy Ghost is good at what he does. He's convicting men and women. He's showing them unclean ways, unclean lifestyle. Showing them that they haven't been washed. They did it. They forgot about it. But they're still carrying this, the filth of it around. And God, it, it's a plague. It, it, it'll infect your ha their house. The kids that turn out that way are worse. And Father, I'm asking you, God, to help each and every one who calls out to you to make them clean make them pure make them whole and holy father make us a holy church not holier than thou not lifted up with pride but God just make us clean and keep us clean. And when we get out and get defiled in this world, come back, get cleaned again. Because this world is filthy and we're living in it and it'll always be that way until you take us out. Now, Father, I pray to your God that you would bless and use this word, Father, to be an encouragement to somebody, to be a blessing to somebody, to be a challenge to somebody, to be a chastening to somebody. To be a warning to somebody. And then change somebody's ways today. Make them a different person. For your glory's sake and your name's sake. Your holiness' sake. You've written us your word, Father, so that Jesus can wash us with this word. So that the bride is presented to Jesus, a chaste virgin, pure and undefiled. Father, forgive sins, cleanse people, make them whole. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our friend, our brother, our king, our advocate, our mediator. Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Stand to your feet.